assalamu alaikum uh, and dr veenish sayed and i am an infectious disease consultant at the sind infectious diseases hospital and research center this is my uh, second um, tutorial for our youtube channel and today i'm going to talking about a very common but important topic that is uh, the community acquired pneumonia in adults so let's begin with our presentation moving forward uh, so community acquired pneumonia by definition refers to an acute infection of the parenchyma of the lungs that occurs outside of the hospital that is acquired in the which means that is it is acquired in the community it is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide uh, especially in the elderly age group uh, so basically what happens in pneumonia is that uh, you acquire the pathogen Uh, through droplet or air, or aerosol, and it travels down into the your, your lung parenchyma, and as 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 it is shown here in the uh, diagram to the right, uh, where it causes an inflammatory reaction in the alveoli, uh, and the deposition of uh, fluid and pus, that is the W uh, white blood cells, inflammatory cells in the air space. a containing bacteria and blood cells as well uh, uh, it fill uh, fills in the it fills the alveoli and cause pneumonia uh, and that uh, appears and this fluid these fluid fill alveoli appear as the opacification in the uh, in the x rays uh, uh, in the op 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 opacification that we see on the x, x rays so uh, pneumonia can affect uh, Uh, at uh, and anybody at any age, uh, any uh, gender, irrespective. But there are certain risk factors uh, which are more prone to develop pneumonia. Uh, these these people are more prone to develop pneumonia, especially people who are older, uh, like more than sixty five years old. Those who have chronic comorbidities, especially those who are having structural lung diseases, like. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, bronchiectasis, asthma, heart diseases, uh, di diabetes, and other immunocompromising conditions like HIV or certain type of cancers. Another risk factor is uh, an antecedent viral respiratory tract infection, especially in, uh, an infection with an influenza virus. Impaired uh, airway protection, like uh alteration in the consciousness as seen with seizures or dementia or loss of consciousness uh, airway um ob uh, obstruction of the airway like uh, uh, and with conditions like uh, and, and the uh, esophageal obstruction that causes dysphagia smoking and alcohol overuse obviously other lifestyle lifestyle factors like crowded living conditions especially with uh poverty and uh, places like prisons or hostels or in military barracks uh, so they all uh, lead to all all these conditions uh, they predispose to pneumonia uh, and uh, also to exposure to a envi certain environmental toxins as well so uh, what are the uh, typical microorganisms or more, uh, more common microorganisms that cause pneumonia So basically, there are three uh, main uh, groups of organisms. Uh, one group are the typical bacteria. The second are the atypical bacteria, and third one are the respiratory viruses. All three of them can cause pneumonia, and uh, the clinical presentation or the way they present the pneumonia is present uh, by the, these three different organisms are essentially the same, uh, and it. Uh, on the base on the basis of the clinical presentation, it is very difficult to distinguish the cause of the uh, pneumonia. Uh, so uh, and uh, so, uh, but there there are certain characteristics to uh, uh, certain characteristics of each of these organisms. But we we'll go uh, but we we'll go in the discussion later on, and uh, it certainly is beyond the scope of our very uh, of our this, this brief presentation. So. Uh, the typical bacteria uh, that can cause pneumonia uh, the most common 
uh, uh, bacterial cause is streptococcus pneumonia and, and pneumonia and it is also the most common cause of pneumonia worldwide other bacteria include haemophilus influenzae morgella cataralis staph aureus and other bacteria uh, certain gram negative uh, rods like enteria bacterial especially klebsiella and e coli can also cause pneumonias and aspiration pneumonias uh, may uh, in aspiration pneumonias anaerobes and microaerophilic bacteria can are also implicated so atypical bacteria uh, they are those uh, these are the, these are those bacteria that are difficult to obtain micro microbiologically that is they do not uh, uh, they're not Uh, identified on the gram stain and they're difficult to grow on culture and they have a dif different clinical presentation than the typical bacteria that is they present differently on the radiographs and uh, their presentation might not be as uh, 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 as with the uh, bacterial pneumonia like they might present with dry cough and they have, might, might have a, a more uh, involvement of the uh, systemic involvement like in legionella common atypical bacteria include legionella species mycoplasma pneumoniae chlamydia and they also have certain ep epidemiological risk factors as well like legionella is associated with uh, exposure to uh, water sources contaminated water sources and chlamydia cystitis is associated with exposure to certain birds uh, 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 and the respiratory the third uh, the third group of organisms are the respiratory viruses the most common of the, uh, these are influenza a and b viruses and of course the sars cov2 pandemic that we are all part of these days um that is the most common cause of pneumonia these days the coronavirus pandemic sars cov2 and there are other coronaviruses as, as well uh, uh, whose epidemic we have uh, dealt with like mers cov and sars cov sars cov1 uh, other viruses that cause pneumonia in uh, pediatric age group like respiratory syncytial viruses uh, human methanemo viruses parent influenza viruses and others so clinical presentation of uh, pneumonia uh, i'm sure all of you must know but the basic uh, uh, the basic symptomatology can be divided into the pulmonary and the systemic ones so um, the major symptoms are cough which could be with or without sputum production it can be dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain these are the typical pulmonary symptoms of pneumonia and uh, uh, the uh, signs include uh, tachypnea uh, with increased work of breathing on examination you can find additional breath sounds like rails crackles and sometimes wheezes especially if the patient is asthmatic Uh, and uh, there would be uh, tactile tremors and uh, dullness to percussion as well and changes in the uh, auscultatory sounds like egophony ag <clears throat> and then on uh, systemic uh, features include obviously fever majority of the patients do present with fever that can be associated with with chill sometimes uh, a lot of patients present with fatigue malaise anorexia is also a very common symptom in severe illnesses and with severe pneumonia there can be signs present, uh, signs and symptoms of sepsis like hypotension altered mental status and symptoms of organ dysfunction especially with renal dysfunction liver and or thrombocytopenia uh, you can see tachycardia and uh, in the laboratory you can see leukocytosis with a leftward shift or or, e or either leukopenia as well and uh, uh, a um, uh, inflammatory markers like esr crp they can both be raised uh, procalcitonin in cases of bacterial infection you can find that elevated uh, especially this is a specific for bacterial infection but uh, a, a, a normal procalcitonin does not essentially rule out bacterial infection if uh, even for diagnostic purposes so it is no no longer recommended to guide initiation of antibiotics uh so uh the best uh, modality to diagnose um, pneumonia it relies on the clinical presentation the signs and symptoms along with the chest x ray the typical presentation of pneumonia with either consolidation or bilateral infiltrates along with the uh, clinical picture of fever cough pleuritic chest pain sputum 
uh, pretty much pick up the, uh, for uh, pretty much make the diagnosis very clear and uh, in most of the cases uh, further uh, testing uh, for uh, further testing is not required especially when you're treating your patient as an uh, in the outpatient department in ambulatory settings and the symptoms are mild uh, uh, all you have to do is get a chest x-ray and prescribe antibiotic uh, and uh, oral, antibi oral antibiotics and call the patient for a follow-up. But in cases uh, where the uh, admission is uh, deemed necessary, you have to sometimes get uh, microbiological testing done, uh, like sputum or blood, sputum or blood cultures, uh, sputum, sputum and blood cultures. So these are the patients who present to you with moderate uh, intensity symptoms uh, of pneumonia, uh, either getting admitted to general medical ward or to the intensive care unit. If the symptoms are severe, you, you get uh, generally you, uh, you get blood cultures for these patients. You send sputum gram stain and culture for uh, microbiological uh, for specific microbiological bio diagnosis, and if available, urinary antigen testing for S pneumonia. Uh, for early diagnosis and testing for Legionella species, uh, PCR when available or urinary antigen testing is in order if, if, if it's available. And for, uh, for nowadays, uh, COVID testing, testing for COVID is, manda is ma mandatory uh, for all patients presenting with signs and symptoms of pneumonia. Other than that, uh, when there is an epidemic going on for influenza, influenza A, you also get a PCR testing done, done for influenza viruses as well. So some chest x-rays, some typical chest x-rays for different uh, presentations of pneumonia. On the left, you can see uh, typical bacterial pneumonia with consolidation in the right, middle, and lower lobe. And uh, on the right, you can see bilateral infiltrates a typical present uh, with reticular non nodular sh shadowing, a typical presentation of an, of an atypical pneumonia. Uh, and the third picture is that of a cavitatory pneumonia, which can be seen with chronic uh, cases of chronic pneumonias like uh, fungal pneumonias, TB, uh, and, and acute presentations. It can be seen with staphylococcal pneumonias and uh, gram negative pneumonias, especially Klebsiella. So uh, now the next step is assessing the severity of the pneumonias after you make the, make the initial diagnosis. The next step in the emergency department or in the OPD setting, what you have to do is assess the severity of the pneumonia and make the patient case. So there are certain tools to decide that, to assess the severity and two important scales, two very useful scales for that are the pneumonia severity index or PSI or the fourth scale as it is commonly known. And the other one is the CURB 65 scale. So I'm not going to go into the details of the pneumonia severity index. They're available on the internet and you can utilize that scale, put, the, uh, put these parameters on the calculator and calculate, uh, get the scores uh, done uh, um, automatically. Uh, and the other one is CURB 65, which is uh, not as sensitive as the PSI scale, but it is more easily, uh, uh, it can, it is more, um, how can I, uh, how can I put it? It's more easier to use and it is more uh, practical. So CURB 65 stands for, C stands for confusion uh, with an abbreviated mental score of less than eight or orientation of less than three as assessed by time, place and person. Uh, U stands for urea or BUN of more than or equal to 20. Uh, R stands for respiratory rate, which, should, which would be more than or equal to 30 breaths per minute. Uh, B stands for a systolic BP of less than 90 or a diastolic BP of less than 60. And 65, obviously, the age being more than or equal to 65. So when the score, a curve 65 score is 0 to 1, which means, it, it means that the pneumonia is mild to moderate. And uh, uh, after additional assessment, like uh, for uh, hypoxia or uh, hypoxia, which means uh, uh, an oxygen saturation of less than 92% or inability to take oral medications or additional uh, problems like inability to um, for a, for a follow-up or 
no place to stay. So a, a patient coming from a far flung area, no place to stay. So in, the, in that uh, scenarios, you can consider the admission, but otherwise such patients can be treated as outpatient. But with a score of more than or equal to two, that means that your patient has a severe community acquired pneumonia and hospitalization is recommended. So uh, now placement is either ambulatory care and the other option is a hospital admission. So patients who are otherwise healthy, that means they are vitally stable, uh, except for maybe fever. Obviously, fever, or fever would be there if they're presented with pneumonia, but otherwise there is no hypotension or tachycardia or no signs of distress, and the patient is healthy with no com comorbidities, and the PSR score is of one to two, and the CURB score is of zero, and in cases of age more than 65, it's one, then you can safely send the patient home on oral antibiotics. But a uh, patient who has a peripheral oxygen saturation of less than 92% on the room air and a PSI score, score of more than or equal to three and a CURB score of more than or equal to one. More than two of the age is more than 65 years, these patients should be taken in and hospitalized. So uh, now intensive care admission, obviously those who are present with critical and severe pneumonias like uh, respiratory failure that requires immediate ventilation, uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation, and those in sepsis requiring vasopressor support. So these are, there's no question about it, no two ways about it. These are the patients that go into the intensive care unit immediately. But what about those patients who are, who are not, uh, who do not immediately require mechanical ventilation or vasopressor support, but they have imminent signs and, uh, but they have signs and symptoms that that require immediate attention or they have imminent, uh, imminent features that, that are indicating that they might require mechanical ventilation and vasopressor support soon in the future. So uh, the IDSA in American Thoracic Society has devised these minor criteria. And if a patient is meeting at least three of these criteria, then he, they should be put into an intensive care unit. And these criteria include altered mental status, uh, hypotension requiring fluid support, temperature of less than 36, which is 96.8 degree Fahrenheit, a respiratory rate of more than or equal to 30 breaths per minute, arterial oxygen tension uh, to fraction of inspired oxygen or PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 250, BUN of more than uh, or equal to 20 uh, milligrams per deciliter, Leukocyte count of less than 4,000, which means leukopenia, a platelet count of less than 100,000, which means thrombocytopenia, and multi lobar infiltrates. So these are all the features that, and at, if at least three of them are present, so that warrants that your patient should be placed in the intensive care unit. Let's say your patient has severe, severe pneumonia and he should be placed in the intensive care unit. So now coming on to the treatment, uh, we have categorized the patients according to their severity of the disease and according to their age and comorbidities, right? So in patients who are less than 65 years, who are otherwise healthy, have no comorbidities and have not recently used antibiotics, giving them oral amoxicillin in a dose of one gram, three times daily, plus a macrolide, which could be either azithromycin or clarithromycin, or in, instead of a macrolide, you can also add doxycycline, right? Now, uh, the other cr group that, uh, that is treated as outpatient include those who have major comorbidities, and we all know what are those comorbidities, plus either those who are smokers or who have used antibiotics within the past three months. Now, their choices include an oral extended release, amoxicillin flavonate, or commonly known as augmentin, and those of two grams twice daily, plus for atypical coverage, macrolide, which is preferred, or either a doxycycline. Next option is a third generation oral cephalosporin, and the options are cefcodoxime, cefditorin, not cefexime. Cefexime has, does not have a good penetration into the lung parenchyma, so avoid cefexime for pneumonias, plus either a macrolide or, or a doxycycline. Doxycycline is a very good option for atypical pneumonias. So instead of a macrolide, you can also try doxycycline. Or a respiratory fluoroquinolone can be used as a monotherapy in an outpatient as well in the oral A form. And a newer agent, when you, uh, when you cannot use these above agents, especially the beta-lactam agents, 
So in, in cases of severe allergies, you can give a lefamulin. This is a newer drug. All right, treatment. Um, now continuing on the treatment. Okay, so one thing I, that I forgot to mention while uh, going through the diag diagnostic part is that around 62% of, uh, of the patients uh, who undergo microbiological testing, they do not come up with any positive culture. So uh, uh, mo most of the patients, uh, they do not have a positive sputum or a blood culture. They, need, they are generally treated empirically. Uh, what is the reason behind this? Uh, uh, it's, that's a, an, another um, topic to talk about. There are a lot of reasons, multiple reasons about it. That's beyond our scope right now. But uh, essentially it means that uh, um, reaching a microbiological diagnosis for pneumonia is not easy. So uh, empirical treatment and choice of antibiotics uh, uh, following the guidelines to the T is very important for that. So, and you have to know the, the organisms that are generally present in your uh, community and your resistance patterns as well. So uh, what about the inpatient antibiotic therapy now? So here again, we categorize uh, patients into uh, two groups. Uh, so basically the treatment uh, for general medical ward and intensive care unit, they are essentially the same. It's just that in, in patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit, you, uh, you generally start the treatment within one hour of admission uh, because these patients are generally in sepsis. So you do not delay the treatment. You do not wait for any kind of uh, testing or uh, any kind of uh, labs to come, laboratory work to show but you just start, your goal is to start the antibody within, within one hour of presentation. Uh, and you do not treat them as, a, you do not give them monotherapy. Now here you have to consider the uh, colonization with Pseudomonas and MRSA as well. So in patients who have, who have no suspicion of MRSA or Pseudomonas, like previously healthy patients, never received an antibiotics, no structural lung disease, uh, no cavitatory lesions on the X-ray, no multilobar infiltrates on the X-ray, uh, admitted to the general ward. So what you can give here is simply start a beta lactam plus a macrolide. You can start with IV, give it for 48 hours, and then de escalate to oral. And Or you can start with a monotherapy with a respiratory fluorocolon. Uh, but for those patients who had uh, called known colonization or a prior infection with pseudomonas, uh, like recent uh, a re recent hospitalization with IV antibiotic use or other strong suspicion for pseudomonal infection. Now you have to give a combination therapy with two anti-pseudomonal beta lactam antibiotics, which could either be piperacillin, tetrabactam, cefepime, ceftazidine, meropenem, or imipenem. The one, one of them should be a beta lactam and the other would be an anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolone, either cipro or levofloxacin. Uh, the other group is the, the, is, is the one that has known colonization of prion infection with MRSA or other strong suspicion for MRSA infection. In that case, you have to add an agent with anti-MRSA activity like either vancomycin or linozolid or either of the above regimens. Uh, an alternative to vancomycin or linozolid is ceftarolin, which also has anti-MRSA activity. If, if available, it can also be a good option. So uh, how long do you continue the treatment? The duration of therapy is generally, in cases of mod, uh, mild pneumonias, five days therapy is enough and your uh, patient is being managed as out, uh, outpatient. Uh, but generally what your target is that you have to treat the patient until he has been afebrile and clinically stable for at least 48 hours and minimum of five days is recommended. Mild infection, five to seven days of therapy with severe infection or chronic comorbidities generally require seven to 10 days of therapy. Adjunctive steroids are not routinely recommended in cases of community acquired pneumonia, except for patients who present with septic shock that does not respond to vasopressors, that does not re respond to fluid therapy. Sorry. So uh, this was a, a rapid and quick review of uh, how to diagnose and manage and identify community-acquired pneumonia. 
I hope this talk was helpful for you. And uh, we hope to see you in the future as well. So goodbye for now. Thank you.